Racer here, Lee Craft, and we've got another quarantine special interview for DragRacing.tv, inspired by Strutmasters.com. We've caught up with Matt and Angie Smith and their little fur baby. Let's fur babies. Clue us in first on uh, who's joining us in the interview. Well, this is Mocha, and this is Bella, and we have another Dotson running around here. She's probably finding her ball. And she's Coco Chanel. So we have three Dotsons, and we also have a Chihuahua. She, her name's Harley, but she's 13 years old, so she don't get out much. Well, definitely, y'all loaded up with the fur babies. Do these travel along with you to the NHRA events? Yes, they uh, they go to all the races with us. Wow, full house, two humans, four dogs. Wow, amazing. I imagine the RV is filled with excitement all the time at the NHRA national events. Always, they're, they're our alarm uh, system also. Awesome, awesome. Hey, they got to help somehow. They can't just consume all the time. They got to help some way. Yep. So, guys, look, we're under this quarantine lockdown for the coronavirus. The coronavirus is affecting a lot of things in our world. It's obviously affected racing, in particular drag racing. Big announcement from the NHRA today. They have completely changed the schedule I have even made changes now for the points and the countdown implications. Give me your thoughts on what the NHRA has announced concerning the schedule. Well, you know, uh, they're doing the best they can with what's going on right now. I mean, of course, we all wanted to be racing, you know, earlier, and, and you know, we want to race our regular schedule and, and have the countdown. But um, the way it sits right now, we're getting a late start. So I think it's only fair, uh, in, in essence, to uh, – to just race on points, you know, and throw the countdown out this year because, I mean, when we start racing, you know, that first week of June, when we go back to Gainesville, and hopefully we're there, you know, at that point, you know, hopefully we don't get backed up because of rain or weather or, or something else that comes out, you know, that they delay this process a little bit more because of this virus. But um, when we do, it's going to be back to back. You know, I mean, we're looking at – there's two weekends off from what I, what I see of rain dates for races in uh, – from now till the end of the year, and uh, that's a lot of racing uh, for us. You know, I, I know NASCAR, they're used to that kind of racing. But uh, NHRA, we're not used to racing, you know, six, seven, eight, nine races in a row, you know, and that's, uh, that's what's getting ready to happen. And, uh, but we got to do it, and we're going to do it. We're going to do the best we can, and, uh, you know, we're going to push forward. And hopefully uh, all the fans come out because I know they're going to want to get out of that house after being quarantined and uh, – no better way to come out and support NHRA and, and come support, you know, drag racing and uh, uh, just come out and show us. We'll, we'll, we're we're going to put a show on for you. Definitely. Now, it looks like there are at least two tracks that will – well, three tracks that will not have their NHRA national event. Um, the one that I'm most saddened about, the NHRA Southern Nationals, that's my home national event. The New England Nationals apparently won't be run this year either, and the Virginia Nationals. Let me tell you, of those three, tell me which one breaks your heart the most. Well, you know, we like the English town, you know, the Eng New England race. Uh, we raced there twice, and uh, MSR dominated both races. Uh, Angie won her first race there, and uh, John Hall, our other team bike, won the other race. So, the two times we were there, we, we dominated that race, and we really loved that racetrack. But they took us out after two years. And, uh, you know, but the Virginia track, for instance, that's four hours from us. I mean, we test there a lot. And Tommy Franklin is, you know, a really, really good guy, races himself, you know, with the Pro Mod cars and always puts on a great show and a good job. And, man, I hate to see him not get a race this year. That's just – that's really bad, I think, for, for his deal and his track. and uh. So, with the NHRA announcing this wild change in the schedule, Matt and Angie, look, it seems like we're going to miss out on three venues at least. And that being one, I'm most saddened about the Southern Nationals in Commerce, Georgia. That's my home national event. The New England Nationals up there in Epping. And apparently the Virginia Nationals as well. Tell me about not hitting those tracks and which one breaks your heart the most. 
Well, you know, we'll just start with the New England. Uh, the New England Nationals was a, a pretty good race for MSR, for our team. You know, uh, the first two years we were there, Angie won her first race there in NHRA, and so did John Hall. He won a race there. So we dominated that race, uh, uh, and then they took that away from us. So we really enjoyed going there. But, uh, you know, then we moved south a little bit. We go to, to, to Tommy's track, you know, the Virginia, Virginia Nationals. And, man, Tommy's a, such a great guy. I mean, he's a pro mod racer. He races against my dad and owns the PDRA, owns the track. And, man, I'm just really saddened to see him lose that race because we turned some good times there. I mean, I, I think that was close to national record times there at that race. And he put a lot of effort into to making that race uh, good and did what NHRA wanted. So I feel bad for him losing that race this year. But uh, hopefully we'll continue that uh, the following years, you know. And then we head on to Atlanta. And Atlanta, I think, was a very important race. I mean, NHRA owns that track, for one, and I'm really surprised they canceled that race. The second reason is that's Coca-Cola's headquarters. You know, Mel Yella, our class sponsor, our series sponsor, they are, that's their home track, and that's where they always brought their, you know, executives and everybody to there. So I'm really sad to see them take that race away. Even though we didn't run fast there, it was always hot, and it was always, you know, slippery track and you know it was uh, more of a tuners race than than anything um just Melly yellow they always put on a champion's dinner there on thursday night uh for for every past champion of the pro series all four categories and that has been something that's been going on since i won my championship first one in 2007 that we've been going to every year and we really enjoy that so uh you know kind of sad at that so sad to see all three venues not being there but if I had to pick one, the worst, I'm really sad for Tommy Franklin because uh, such a great guy. He's done a lot for our sport. Maybe not for NHRA in general, but for drag racing. Uh, he's done a lot for us. So, uh, you know, hopefully uh, things will get better for him. Yeah, some of these venues definitely rely on that big card of the NHRA national event coming in. I'm sure Tommy, with all his connections and all that he is able to do and has done, he'll figure something out for Virginia at that motor park motorsports park and they'll have some other rocking show come in and knock the socks off of fans as they stand in those great stands at his complex so folks look everybody that may see this matt angie smith myself the monday morning race we're all dealing with this coronavirus pandemic i'm up in new york it's on lockdown all are in north carolina how are you getting through this? What are y'all doing day to day to pass the time and make the most of the time in this forced vacation that we all have? Well, it's a forced vacation. I say this, it's a forced vacation for the world and for all you guys, but with our shop being right beside our house, um, we haven't closed the doors since it's just me and him that always works here and the dogs. Um, we've been working nonstop every day, just trying to find horsepower, trying to do everything just so we can have that competitive edge when we go back racing. We've really been focused on our program in the winter, but we kind of got a little bit behind the eight ball because we got some parts late. And so it kind of delayed our program in the winter. With having the, couple, the last couple of weeks off has kind of been good because we've kind of caught up all the stuff that we wanted to do over the winter, but wasn't able to. And I feel like, you know, I definitely feel like we could start the season today and we would be okay. It's just, we were a little bit behind the eight ball. We got a new trailer too. So switching all the stuff over to the new trailer took, a, you know, more than a week to do, organize everything. When you get a brand new trailer, it's a different layout. You got to organize everything. So that takes quite a bit of time. And I felt like when we went to Gainesville, we were there, but I don't feel like we were there at 100% capacity because everything wasn't labeled and, you know, like like the things that I like to do. So when the crew guys come to the to the track, they know where everything is because this is a totally different deal. And so it has given us time to catch up on the little tedious things like that that we've had to do. So all in all, you know, I just want everybody to wash their hands, do everything the government says so this can go away very fast and so we can go back racing because as everybody knows you know their job is their most important thing in their life and their family and their kids 
well, racing is probably one of the most important things in our life. And we want to go back racing. We want to go back racing because it's what we love to do. We're passionate about it and we want to be there for the fans. Definitely. Well, I also have this another question with the coronavirus. I know, Angie, your dad was diagnosed with some cancer recently, and he's already had surgery. Uh, how is he doing? Is he under any, you know, special precautions with everything that's going on? How's he doing? He's doing good. Uh, he had surgery about a month ago, and we are keeping him locked in the house. And um, there's only, like, two people, me, myself, and my aunt Peggy and my sister are usually the only three people that go over there and see them. We're trying to keep visitations very minimal. You know, we went to the grocery store, we've done everything that we needed to do so he can't go out in public. Um, he's also diabetic. So with him having pancreatic cancer and being diabetic, you know, that is kind of like a double whammy. They were very fortunate enough to get all the cancer. They didn't have any lymph node involvement, no blood vessel involvement, which is very, very good when it comes to talking the C word. And um, so he's doing good. I mean, he has good days and bad days, but um, all in all, his health is improving every day. His strength is improving every day. I think that he's really ready for us to go back racing, not because I won't be there, but he's just ready to watch some racing on TV. <laughs> Definitely. All we've had here recently is uh, NASCAR doing their e-NASCAR co-invitational races, which has been good. They've been enjoyable. You know, last night, Ron Caps was doing some racing in the replacement series with iRacing. With bringing that up, guys, i got to ask, would y'all like to see something from the NHRA, maybe working with iRacing or some other game developer to create some type of drag racing simulation that's accessible for you drivers and fans and be able to interact in that way and even provide some racing entertainment just as in a time like this? Well, you know, I have an iRacing simulator also, and I've, I've done it for the last, I don't know, nine, ten years. And I raced with Ron Capps. We Actually, if you looked at the interview he did on NHRA two or three nights ago, he mentioned my name because we've been racing a lot together here lately. Uh, I didn't race in that race last night because, one, I wasn't invited. So, you know, it was only invitation. Um, but normally I can hold my ground pretty good on it. And, and for that fact, I would really like NHRA. I've pushed our race in a couple of times with talking to some of the people to do an NHRA thing. And it just, I think you got to have the, menu, the organization go to them and push them to do it also. And I think if we did that, even if they didn't get the bikes in right now, if they just, just, just did Top Fuel and Plenty Car right now, it would be so awesome. I mean, we'd love for them to do the Pro Stock Car and Pro Stock Bike too, but, man, just to have the interaction with NHRA people and the NHRA fans on, on something like that, I think it would bring a whole new venue to their, uh, their organization and, and to iRacing in general. I agree, Matt. I think NHRA's definitely got to look at that route and – get going with that program you know if you want to get new fans in and young fans and young fans are definitely looking how can i be involved in motorsports through simulation as well as in real life i think it's an avenue the nhra has got to look at speaking of i racing though since you brought since i brought it up and since you are in i racing i didn't realize that you gotta tell me what's your favorite type of car to race in and where do you like to race at I just got started back doing it about, you know, when this epidemic come on. So I, I kind of gotten off of it the last year or so, um, just because we had so much work in the shop to do. But there for, I don't know, four or five years, I was on it. I'd leave the shop, I'd eat supper, and I'd go up there and I'd race. I was in these leagues and all that. And the league I used to be in the most was they raced the trucks. And the trucks were really fun to race. We raced every racetrack just like NASCAR does. And they had a little series, but... Man, I, I really enjoy the trucks, but I like the challenge of, like, you know, the F1 car, the, the cup car, you know, even some dirt stuff. I, I've started doing some of the dirt stuff with Tommy DeLago and, and Ron Caps in those rooms. So uh, it's kind of fun to do it, and I, I, I'm having a good time, and it just shows you how, how hard it is to drive some of them cars sometimes because if you watched the broadcast the other day, those guys said, you know, a couple of them said, hey, this is actually harder to drive than our actual race car, you know, that we're out here on the same track, he says. So it's a uh, it's, it's, it's pretty neat deal, man. And you see some people that's really good at it. That's their, their future stars of going into, into <coughs> racing, I'd say. 
Yes, simulation racing, though it's not in the real real world, it is definitely challenging and it's not just a video game especially when you get to the eye racing level but let's talk about some real racing so <laughs> they're centered in between you and angie you've got that 201.76 miles per hour you right now hold that title you can say you're the fastest pro stock motorcycle rider in the world man how does that feel feels awesome i mean i, I... I got to say thank you to Denzo for putting the club up. First off, I mean, they they put the 200 mile an hour club up and, uh, you know, they are one of our, you know, main sponsors, you know, on our deals. But for them to put the money up for that club is is phenomenal. Um, I wasn't the first one to do it. I wasn't on a V-Twin at the time that <coughs> they started that. I was on a Suzuki and really didn't have a chance of making that 200 mile an hour deal at first. But once I got back on my own bike, um, I become the third member of it, and year to date, I've ran more 200 mile an hour passes than any of the other ones combined. You know, from Hector Jr. to Eddie Craywick combined, I've run more 200 mile an hour passes, and I think I'm the currently only one that's ran over 200 mile an hour when they added the 15 pounds onto us. So it's a it's a pretty neat deal. We have a lot of power. We have good power, and uh, you know, I, I really want to get Angie in that club. I mean. I know they say there's only four spots open, but the, that's not right. The Denzo Club is for eight spots. It's an eight-club series, the first eight people to do two, over 200 mile an hour. Only the first four pay money. The, the last four only get a jacket, you know. Oh, no. But go ahead. <laughs> with the deal. But, you know, the first four things get money um, with it. So, uh, you know, the next one that comes in, I know they say there's only one more spot. There's only one more spot for the money from what I'm understanding. but. There's, there's five more spots available, and I would like to get Angie in there and, and her to become the first female to be in there, but we'll wait and see what happens. Well, with you being the fastest, and to stay the fastest, you've got to go out and do some testing. I understand that you all went out as a team and did some January testing. How did the testing go? Where did you test? What did you find out? I understand that apparently... Angie, you're locking an older clutch setup that's helping you leave better, like you did a couple of years ago with having a great average uh, reaction time start over everybody. So tell me how testing went and where it went down and how why you're excited for the season whenever it does happen. I'm excited because last year when the tech department added 15 pounds to us, um, with me having so much weight on my bike already, adding 15 more really – just changed the whole clutch setup of my bike and when you know it, it'll it affects every bike that you have to put the 15 pounds on but it really affected mine just because we have so much ballast on my bike now and we really struggled all year with my bike my bike was 60 foot maybe one pass and then it would never be duplicate it would never duplicate itself and i was really frustrated throughout the whole season because I really knew that I had a fast motorcycle. I would run, you know, comparable numbers down the back half with him. But, you know, when you don't get the initial start, the first 60 feet, you know, when I'm behind three and four numbers, you can't make all those numbers up. And I knew I had a fast motorcycle and I just was really frustrated with my gear because my bike wasn't 60 foot. And I think that was our sole problem last year and why I had a lot of hiccups like I did. We went to testing. We changed basically everything on the bike except for me. <laughs> and um, we put we went back to my old clutch setup. And, um, I went out there and I ran very close numbers to him and I was really happy. But, you know, testing is testing. And you never know 100%, you know, what you're going to get when you go to a, an NHRA event versus testing. But I feel, I feel very good and confident about it now because we went testing a second time and we had three other pro stop motorcycles there and I've 60 footed very close to them. So I feel like our problem in the 60 foot department is fixed. Um, I'm a very routine person. I really like our old clutch setup. We've ran one of our clutch setups. We've ran it for 10 years. Last year we did some experimenting with some different clutches. I had three different clutches in my bike over um the course of the year 
and I feel 100% confident when I go to the starting line with my old clutch setup as far as reaction time and as far as leaving and going down the track. And we went back to that in testing and we did really good with it. And we tested the second time with that same clutch setup and, you know, my lights were great. I think my worst light in testing was a 40 and, you know, I might not be the best rider out there and I might not have the fastest motorcycle out there, but I feel like if I can do my job on the starting line and if I can leave the starting line ahead of whoever I'm racing in the other lane, that that gives me a competitive advantage. And so it's my job as a driver to be the first out of the gate and the first to the finish line. So I try to do my job and I feel like he does his job in tune of my bike. So we just, I think we're going to have a good year if all the, if everything falls into place. Matt, uh, were you involved in that testing session? How'd it go for you? Yes, uh, I was involved. Uh, we tested two days with Angie. So the first day we tested with her. Um, and then the second day I tested my bike. And that's when I said that, you know, I didn't, I didn't like the way her bike ran the first day um, compared to the way I ran the second day. So we stayed the third day and tested. And, and we did all this at Bradenton, uh, Florida, um, in January. And so I changed all my, the stuff that was on my bike, I changed it just exactly like I had on my bike to her bike and bam, it was there. And um, so I feel very confident about her bike. I mean, we all have identical bikes from the motors to the bodies to the chassis. All three, mine, Angie's and Scotty's bikes are identical. It's just the little stuff. And sometimes the little stuff costs two, three, four hunters. And that's, that's, that's where it's at. I mean, you're not getting beat by a tenth anymore. You're not getting beat by five, six hundreds. You're getting beat by a hundred or two hundreds, or sometimes it comes on even thousands. So it's just the little stuff that you have to put together. And every bike, every chassis, everything's always a little different. And everything takes just a little different tune up or a little different weight here, a little different weight there. So it's just, but my testing went really good. I was very happy. Um, we made some very good numbers, ran some good numbers. And even Scotty, when we unloaded the last run he ran, he went some, uh, it was almost 2,400 feet, and he went 684, 197 something. So uh, he was happy with uh, our test right after Gainesville. So I think I think we'll have three good bikes uh, this year. Uh, I think three bikes can be competitive and run for a championship. That's good news. I know I was watching testing with the Harley gang down there at Orlando. I got to get them on camera when I was filming the test sessions after the World Door Slammer Nationals. They were excited about how they were running, and Jail was running exceptionally well. Actually, the other two riders, they were kind of shocked how well she was actually performing. It's good news to hear y'all are performing well, so maybe it's going to be a Matt Smith racing versus Harley all throughout the year. That would be pretty cool. We'll be excited over that. So, can, speaking of competition, you know, I know not everyone gets along in the pits. You have that. And uh, your dad is famous for having some of those tricky moments. I mean, he's even got the nickname Tricky Ricky Smith. Uh, he mentioned yesterday in the interview that I had with him of having a burn down with Warren Johnson where he even shut the engine off and waited for Warren to pull in. You've had a few of those moments, Matt. I was looking back. Uh, you had one with Hector Arana. I can't remember the track, but. I mean, the starter, Mark, he came up and did a buster couch move and told y'all to cut it off and go back. What was it like being in a moment like that, the fans getting stirred up? I mean, we love to see that. It makes drag racing exciting. So from the from underneath the helmet, what's it like to go through those type of moments? Yeah, the, uh, the instance you're talking about is, is Hector. We was at Gainesville. It was actually Mark Lyle's first race for the motorcycle. <laughs> um, so that was his third race of the year. He just started. And, uh, you know, uh, there's a couple people. I mean, there's two people really I don't get along with in HRA. And, and, and you know, I say I don't get along with them in, in our bike thing. Me and Steve Johnson have had words before. And so have me and Hector Rana. And I'm just to that point that if, I'm going to do what I want to do, you know, because I just made sure that I wasn't going to stage first against Hector that race. And he had in his mind, he wasn't going to stage first. Well, I know for a fact, and I'm pretty sure of a fact that 
my bikes have the biggest gas tanks on the property. We do. All right. <laughs> so I'm not weight conscious. I'm not worried about the weight. We have big gas tanks. So whenever people want to play games with us, I say bring it on, you know, because I'll sit there till we run out of gas, you know, but I know my bike's not going to run out of gas. And when I know there is over there sputting and spattering, I'm going to go on a pre, I'm going to go on a stage so I can turn the tree on or they get red lighted. But that's the case. That's what happened in that deal. Um, he runs a little, a smaller gas tank. And from what I was told by his crew guy, uh, a couple races later, it blew up on the run because he ran out of fuel, you know, it leaned it out and blew it up going down the racetrack. But, uh, you know, I've had those deals with Michael Phillips before, even Andrew Hines. We've played the games before. Um, I love doing it because I don't win them all, all the time, but I feel like if you play that game with me, probably 80% of the time I turn that win light on because you, you've fallen into my hands. And I learned from one of the best, who is my dad, Tricky Ricky, uh, probably one of the greatest door slammers of all time. Uh, uh, I call him the goat. I call him dead. But, you know, I love to play the game. And it's just, it's a mental thing. And when you want to get over there and sit and sit over there and not stage against me, hey, I'm fine with it. There's a, there's a lot of times I'll go on a stage first. But if I'm in that mood that I've told myself I'm not staging against that person, that guy or that girl, we're going to sit there. And if we get cut off, we get cut off. <clears throat> Definitely. I was watching some footage last night of, with, of your dad, in fact, and oftentimes he used every second before finally rolling from pre-stage to stage. And oftentimes he would leave the line first. I mean, he knows what he's doing up there on the line. You definitely would have to know what you're doing with 11 championships and several different classes. I'm curious, though, what does the starting line official say to the competitors in a situation like that? You know, you and Hector, y'all got shut off and got told to go back. I mean, you don't get to see, you know, Look, Buster's not up there no more, uh, you know, and you used to see that a lot with him. And he had a iron fist, it seemed like, over that starting line. And Mark pushes y'all back. What gets said in your ear from an NHRA official in that type of moment? Well, Mark, I think Mark went over to Hector first and said something. But when he come back to me, he says, look, he says, we're going to let you run at the back of the line. But he said, be smart because I'm not going to cut you off again. Next time I cut you off, you're both out. So um, we went back up there, and, you know, I still didn't stage first. I think he staged first, and, and I went right on in right after him. But, you know, um, I, 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 was, I was determined I was going to stage last. And, like I said, I, we had the biggest gas tanks out there. So whenever somebody wants to play the game, bring it on. I'm ready to play the game. Awesome. So looking over your career, you've been on a lot of bikes, both you and Angie. So tell me, guys. What has been the favorite bike to each of you? I know for me, uh, Matt, that victory you had, I loved that blue victory. That thing just looked me. It looked like you could roll off the pits and go down to the local motorcycle club, and it would fit right in. That was an awesome bike. But from you two, what's been the best bikes? I think um, my favorite bike is the one that I have now. I've always wanted a pink and black motorcycle, and when Denzo – when me and Denzo did the deal together, when Lisa wanted to sponsor me, she said she wanted to give me what I wanted as a female. And she loved that I want to, sh I want to be pink and black and I want to show that I'm a female to everybody. And um, so she granted me the wish to paint, paint it pink and black. And I'm pretty biased, but I would say I have the prettiest motorcycle in the pits. So it's very flashy and very beautiful. It's, paint and um i love paint on a motorcycle versus a wrap they did a great job and um yeah I, this is my second year on the pink and black bike and it's my favorite one yeah i mean i currently like the bike that uh that i'm on right now um i, I did i love the the bagger i love the victory brand stuff um you know we need as a as a business person that i am we need more manufacturers in our deal um, and I would be willing for any manufacturer, whether it's EBR, Ducati, you know, Indian, anybody that wants to come in, I would be willing to work with them and, and, and get them a bike up and running and, you know, show their brand. You know, I mean, 
as a as a class, we need more brand involvement. You know, it's not just about sponsorship. It's about having brand involvement that, you know, you look at Harley Davidson, they've been out there for 20 years, 19 years, whatever it is right now. That's a brand involvement in a motorsports, and everybody knows Harley's been out there. Well, the Indian market, there's Indian guys that hate Harley Davidson, you know, as, as motorcycle riders. Uh, Suzuki, they don't like B-Twin people. So having these manufacturers involved just gives a different part of excitement to get different fans to pick, oh, I, I'm, I'm an Indian guy all the way. Let's beat those Harley guys or let's beat Suzuki, you know. And that's what we need more out there. We need more brand involvement. We need NHRA to let these other brands in, uh, you know, with this deal because that's basically why Victory pulled out. You know, Victory shut the doors because they combined all their stuff to Indian. But Indian was coming in to NHRA, and NHRA said, no, we're, we're, we're not going to allow that because Harley-Davidson will not allow that. So that was on a, a standpoint of where we're at right now. Um, I know if I get a call once a year from them guys and they go, hey, is, is Harley back in? Are they on the midway again this year? Are they still the, the official manufacturer of NHRA? And I said, yes. And they go, well, we're just going to sit on the sidelines until they, they leave. Because in my opinion, I think NHRA should let them in. I think Harley should want the competition to be able to run. You know, they've had all the rules in their favor for all these years, you know, even back the time that they had the four valve motors in, in their bikes and they said, Oh, there's no more power than two valve. Well, we all know that overhead cams is way more. You got way more horsepower than push rods. You know, every car manufacturer has gone to that, you know, so it, it took a year for an HRA to realize that and they cut those motors out, but Harley won 15 of the 16 races that year. So, um, you know, competition is good. Competition is what drives the sport, and you need that kind of competition to to have rivalries, to have you know people, and you know we're probably one of the biggest rivals right now with Harley Davidson because we're 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 one of the teams that can run with them and outrun them, you know, when when we need to. Um, so I feel confident with it, and like I said, I would really like a manufacturer to come in and and get behind us again. It it wasn't that we did MSR did anything wrong while Victory left our sport. It was a simple fact of NHRA and Harley Davidson could not, they, they would not let the Indian protocol come in. And that's just where it's wrong. And we've got to, we've got to move past that and, and let these other manufacturers in, in the sport. Well, 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 NHRA, imagine that. And look, from a fan and having now the Monday Morning Racer YouTube channel and going to the track and interacting with fans, I can tell you from whether it is pro stock, whether it is even a funny car body, or to pro stock motorcycle, people want their brand. And you look at like American Flat Track, it is an intense rivalry between all the brands that are there, especially Indian and Harley. And it would be awesome to see an Indian going down 13, 20 feet at a NHRA national event. You know, Matt, let me explore that a little bit more. What do you think it's going to take? What do you think it's going to take to break the NHRA to get more manufacturers in and speak, if you can, to even some of the other classes? Look, I mean, why don't we have the Toyota Pro Stock? I mean, why not? I mean, you know, why not a Toyota factory stock? What's going to make it good for these brands, good for these manufacturers to have the atmosphere that is the NHRA to come in and compete? Competition drives sales, for first off. Um, manufacturers said we race on the weekends. They sell on Monday morning. You know, if that brand wins, you look at NASCAR. When that brand wins, there's that dealership, those, those <clears throat> brands sell more Monday through that next week, all right? It's, it's just what – look at the progression of NHRA. I love our sport. I love NHRA, but we have to make changes, and we have to make changes for the better. We can't keep making changes for the worse, or we can't keep padding the pockets of people because they keep giving more money. You know, Harley gives a million dollars a year to be on that, that midway. They give NHRA a million dollars a year to be the official bike of NHRA. All right, we got to stop some of that stuff. You know, there doesn't need to be a – there can be an official brand of NHRA. 
they can have exclusive rights to, let's just say, a title. But that don't mean they can't let the uh, other manufacturers into the sport. And and that's what's going on. You know, you, you got Chevrolet, you got Ford, you got Mopar, you got Toyota. They're all in funny car. You know, why can't we have more brands in Pro Stop Bike? Why can't we have more brands in, you know, Pro Stop Car? There's only Chevrolet right now, you know, because Mopar pulled out. Um the whole deal with everything is I don't, I think the reason Toyota hasn't got in to pro stock was a whole thing, just like what they saw with the pro stock bike deal. They didn't want to develop a motor for pro stock car. And now that NHRA is loosening up the reins on the motor configuration, maybe Toyota might want to get in, but with the body style and pro stock car, but from a standpoint, maybe you just need to go to a universal motor and it's, it's it's not a Chevy, it's not a Ford, it's not a Toyota. It's a universal V8, so all these brands can come and run. You know, get more manufacturers involved with it, where everybody's on the same platform. You know, there's no, it's not a Chevrolet motor no more. It's a unified motor for everybody to come and run. You know, still get to do all your stuff, but one manufacturer can make it, they just can't put their stamp on it. So um, everybody gets it. No different in our deal, the V-Twins, Everybody should be able to run a B twin if you want. Um, one person make it, and everybody can buy it and build it and, and run it. No different than the, the 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 inline fours with Suzuki. You know, it shouldn't be just limited to Suzuki's to run that. Kawasaki should be able to come in with that body style. Um, Yamaha, Honda, if they want to bring that body style in, let them. You know, it's just that's what we've got to do. They NHRA's got to loosen up the reins to do that to let these manufacturers come in. The second thing they've got to do is they've got to get their midway back up. I remember going to the racetrack when I was little and I could go down that midway and there were so many trucks and trailers and, and you know, you could do so much stuff out there. Now NHRA wants so much money for these guys to park their trucks and, and then they take a percentage of their sales that's there. And it's like, guys, we got to get away from that. Let these guys come in, let these guys support NHRA. They're paying enough money for their drivers and, and for them to drive up and down the road to get those racetracks. Let's make NHRA great again by letting manufacturers park for free. Let them sell their parts out there. Let them try to make a living. You're making your living. It's going to draw more fans in NHRA. Let them, you make the money on the ticket sales and the food prices. Let the manufacturers come in and sell parts to help their support the business and they'll help support NHRA by doing sponsorship on the TV, sponsorship on cars, stuff like that. I think that's what needs to change with NHRA. And if they do that, we can make NHRA back to where it was, you know, 15, 20 years ago, and it'd be huge out there on the midway and have tons of fans. You know, I looked at old classic NASCAR race the other day that they were running. There was 100,000 people in the stands. Now you look at the race and there's nobody in the stands, you know, when they're there. And it's like, we got to go back to the old stuff in certain ways. You know, we've got to get back to that mentality of getting fans back at the racetrack and getting the manufacturers back there to support the racing. And, uh, I, you know, I just think that's my opinion of what I think they need to do. I, I would have to agree with you. I can remember as a kid going to the Southern Nationals and coming away with bag after bag of free stuff from a jam-packed midway. And now – if I go when I go to the national event, I don't really even really bother hanging around in the midway. It's not much of a midway anymore. You got more food options than you do manufacturing options now. It seems like. Uh, by the way, McDonald's had an awesome midway setup at the Southern Nationals one year. They need to do that again. <laughs> they, they, you know, I don't know why Arby's didn't do it last year, but yeah, the midway needs to be rocking again, and it's just not really there. The, the fan experience has really went down over the last, I would say, decade, maybe even 20 years. <clears throat> and with the fan experience going down, what are some things in the pro stock motorcycle ranks you think you all can do from a pit experience side to make it better for the fans? Because, look, I like Nitro, but there's only like two or three teams that do the, thr do the throttle whack anymore. I mean, that takes away one of the great things of NHRA drag racing. So what are things that you can do in your pits maybe to bump it up in the fan experience? Well, I think them, I think the Pro Stop Motorcycle 
us guys and girls. I think we try to go above and beyond, you know, what the other classes are doing in NHRA currently. We always have a, an autograph session that consists of almost all of the pro stop motorcycle people. We always have that every Friday and we do that. We volunteer our time to go and do that. And I don't think any other class does that. We also at certain tracks, we'll do the NHRA parade, which we come back as a group in front of the grandstands, wave to the fans. And we do that all together as a class. And also um, a couple other tracks where when when the fans leave and they have to go by our pits, we will pull our bikes out and let kids come over and sit on our bikes and take pictures. And I think it's things like that that is very important to fans because you're making lasting impressions on children. And those are the people that's going to be the future of the sport. Um, so I think we do all of those things. I think we could take it one step further and we could have some other engaging things like reaction time testers and things like that. And we also had a hospitality tent um, when we were with Victory one year and where, you know, you could come in and we, they served food. And, you know, if you, I think it was, if you rode a Victory motorcycle, you had your key or whatever, you could come in the hospitality, they would serve you food and everything. So I think that was a really good thing that Victory Motorcycle did when we were sponsored by Victory. And I think it's little key things like that, that makes your class excel and makes your, you as a driver excel. And that can help in HRA. Definitely. I know, I know it seems to me that the pro stock motorcycle riders are extremely accessible. Uh, my first interview ever at a national event was Andy Rawlings and she was out there and I said, Hey, can I get an interview? Never done one before whatsoever. And she's like, sure, let's do it. You know, it was definitely a lot easier than trying to go get an interview from John Forrest. Not that John wouldn't be willing. You just can't want to get near the guy. You gotta, you got levels of this levels of that to, it to a John Force. So, guys, thank y'all for having great fan experiences. Continue to try to even make it better over the years to come because, as you mentioned, Matt, well, the NHRA, they seem to have been slacking in that department. When we go back racing, Matt and Angie Smith, we all need partners to make racing happen. And you've got a great partner in Denso. Every time I hear anything about Denso, Matt and Angie Smith, it is always positive. So clue me in on all this positivity with the company that is Denso. Man, Denso has been such a blessing to, to Matt Smith racing and, and especially to Angie, you know, and myself. Um, I'll tell you a little story about how I got involved with Denzo in essence. Um, we were in Vegas and this was 2000, 2016. And I'll just tell you how great their product is and how good their product is. We were having problems with our Autolite spark plugs. We were cracking the porcelain and, you know, going down the track and these V twins, they vibrate a lot. So we were, we were definitely having problems with them. And I saw this brand on Clay Milliken's car, and I was friends with Clay, and I said, hey, I said, what is Denso? He goes, oh, it's a spark plug. He, he's like, you, you, you know, they make great plugs. I'm like, I said, well, I'm going to SEMA next. Or I said, are they going to be at SEMA next week? And he said, yeah, they got a huge booth, blah, blah, blah. And I, I'm like, I said, can you introduce me to them? And he goes, yeah. So I met Clay. It was over at Apex. And he took me and Angie um, right there into uh, to meet Lisa and met Lisa, talked to her briefly, kind of explained to her my situation. She had a guy named uh, James that was working with her at the time. And I said, hey, I'm, I'm running this plug, but I'm having an awful lot of problems with this plug. I said, I know that I can win races a lot more than I am if I can get a good plug underneath of me that doesn't break going down the racetrack. And she goes, well, let me see. Let me cross-reference the number, and we'll get back with you. Within a couple hours, she already texted me back and had James, this guy James, call me. And he goes, hey, I'll, I'll, I'll bring you a couple sets of plug for you to try at the Pomona race next week. He said, we're in California, and I'm going to come there, and I'll just bring them to you personally. I said, perfect. I said, I'd love to try them. Swear on my life, we put the plugs in. I won the race. 
And that's how the relationship started with Denzo. Um, it, it, just things worked. That was, that was on the victory gunner. Um, I won the very last race of the year with a victory gunner. And it was just amazing. Uh, we switched over the following year to the, the bagger bike, the blue bagger that you like. And um, Angie, the victory decided to go back to one bike instead of two bikes. You know, she struggled with that open fair and bike and you know uh it just takes a lot to pull a bike back with no fairing on the bike and she just she really struggled with it so they cut us back to one bike for the year and in the meantime they had already shut their doors down on victory so they basically they honored the contract with me but they kind of left her out so we went to games when i told angie she's gonna run but we're gonna let her run limited runs on it well, Lisa walks up in the pits at Gainesville, and she goes, well, why didn't Angie make that second qualifying pass Friday? I said, because she doesn't have a sponsor. I said, you know, there's no sponsor, you know, for her bike right now. We got told, you know, when Victory shut down in February, and it just, you can't find nothing. She goes, well, how much does it cost a race? And we told her, she goes, well, let me see what I can do. So it turned out to be that next thing I know, Angie's got a five-race deal with her, which ends up turning to a seven race deal that year. They added two more races and then it went on to a full deal for the following year. And then they picked me up and it's just been ongoing. So it's a, it's a company that is so awesome. They're way bigger than we ever thought they were. They're a global company. They're just not a spark plug. They make parts that's in every vehicle. Any fan out there that has a, that has a vehicle, there's a part on it. That's a Denso part. I can promise you whether it's a spark plug, an alternator, a starter, an oxygen sensor, the motor that rolls your windows up and down. It's probably a Denso motor. motor. Yeah. You know, even the motors that blow the air out of your air conditioning system or the heat system, it's probably a Denso motor. So they're way bigger than we ever thought they were. They're a global multi-billion dollar company. And we didn't know how big they were until we actually got involved. And um, what have they got, 28? I think they have 28 um, manufacturing plants in the United States, and um, I don't know how many they have globally, but um, just an amazing company. And the people, one thing I want to add about Denso that is a little bit different than some of the other sponsors out there is they are involved in our race program. And when I mean that, what I say is they come to the racetrack. They come to our pits. They ask us about the products that we get from them. They ask us about feedback. They are 100% behind the race team. It's easy for a sponsor to write a check, send a check. We might see an email from them once every three or four months. This is not Denzo. Denzo, I talk to Lisa or somebody at Denzo at least every week. They are very heavily involved in NHRA, not just our program. They support Pro Stock Cars. They support our 200 mile an hour program with Denso. And um, they are also involved with sponsoring a race um, for the year. And they're involved in a lot, of many, a lot of things out there. And, you know, that speaks volumes that a company like that wants to be involved in NHRA and be involved with the racers with their program. A great company. I'm so blessed and so fortunate to be sponsored by them. Um, I never in a million years that think that I would have a sponsor as long as I've had them. And the relationship, it's great and it works. And I think they're very happy with us. We're very happy with them. And, you know, I love Denzo. Well, Denzo, thank you for sponsoring Matt Smith Racing. Matt and Angie, thank you for all your involvement in NHRA drag racing. And apparently, thank you for my air conditioning as well. I appreciate that. Definitely appreciate that in hot summer months. Now, Angie, you've got to check out from us. Is that correct? I do. I got to check out. I got I got some more errands to run. I got another interview to do, too. So I got a couple other things on my agenda. All right. Well, Angie, look, thank you. We appreciate you hanging out with us today, and we'll spend a little bit more time with Matt and wrap up. All right. Thank you. See ya. Thank you. Matt. Well, I'm gonna, I want to I wanna say a couple more things here real quick. Since we're, on the, since we're on the sponsor topic, you know, 
we have our sponsors here on the door of the back. That's that's our main sponsors here. Them's is at the top. You can't see that. But Strutmasters right here. Strutmasters.com. I want to say a few words about Chip real quick. Chip is an amazing guy. I, uh, I, I introduced, we introduced him to Scotty Polachek and, and last year. He got on board with them last year, helped them in the countdown. He's a full deal on their deal uh, for Scotty this year uh, on our team. And he's also sponsoring my dad for the year uh, in the Pro Mod car. Um, went to his facility, uh, which is in North Carolina right here, within an hour and a half of where we're at. And just an awesome facility. I mean, just, you know, really proud of Chip of what he's done. Saw where he came from. Uh, he showed us all the pictures and, and all the stuff. And um, really impressed with, with how Chip has uh, made that business as big as it is. And uh, I can't say enough uh, about Chip. And, and, you know, I know he's doing this deal right here with y'all too. But, man, he is putting a lot of money out there for a lot of racers and helping a lot of racers live their dream and uh i just want to tell him thank you for for helping support msr and supporting scotty that's that's on our team too um you know can't say enough about that the other one right above that is greg butcher trucking this guy come on board with me a couple you know a couple years ago and really helped me out with uh he pays for all my fuel going up and down the, the road uh with this big truck of ours and uh He's had a lot of feedback from people, gets a lot of calls. A lot of people in California, when, our, when we won our race out there, he does a lot of business. He does West Coast, East Coast. And mm -hmm. a lot of his companies that he does dealings with said, hey, man, I, I saw your name. A guy said your name on TV. I said, I didn't know you was involved in that. We were at that race. And, you know, so just, just want to say thank you to him. I mean, he helps tremendously on the deal, too. Um, um, so if you need any trucking needs, call that guy too, you know. If you need trucks, call Chip. Look it up. You know, he'll he'll take care of your cars that's got the leaky airbags. I can tell you that because uh they're definitely uh a working they they're they're awesome product. This company right here, Lucas Oil. Couldn't go racing without them guys. Tom Brogner out there at Lucas Oil in California. Uh just amazing. We we had some problems with some of our oil we used them before. We switched over to Lucas. The product's been phenomenal. We he makes us anything I want. We're on the dyno running stuff, and I I, I see I take motors apart and I see a Baron doing this or that, and I call him up and say, Hey, can you add this to 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 our blend? You know, for our next batch, so I can try it. Within two days, I have a five gallon pail to try this oil. You know, here at the shop in North Carolina. So. Just can't say enough about Lucas Oil. They they help us so much, and it's just amazing of what they do for for not only for us. They sponsor the whole Lucas Oil series and Sportsman in HRA, and all the teams that they help. And you know, I know Forrest is kind of getting out of the, the 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 limelight a little bit with the company. You know, he owns it, but Morgan, you know, his son's taking it over and 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 going to new heights with it, and really proud of what Morgan's doing with the company. So just just want to say thank you to them. Um, with that deal and not not last but not not least this guy right here nobody really knows who this guy is he is uh his name is mark stockseth um pretty amazing guy him and his wife marshall um they come to me they come to me in 2006 and we talked a little bit about this and that and you know they were involved with with my dad a little bit in racing, but, you know, wasn't really big out there, you know, and um, he just loved drag racing. And I decided that I wanted to start my own team in 2007. And Mark said, hey, he says, I will help you do this if you want to do it. He said, I like the pro stock, like the pro stock motorcycle. I would like to do that. And we formed a partnership in 2007. And I've been blessed by this guy. I, my real dad is Ricky Smith, all right? But I consider Mark Stocks as my second dad because he is just, he is taking care of me like I'm a son of his. And he is amazing what him and Marshall have done for me. We've won three championships. We won in 07, our first year out we won. We won in 13 and we won in 18. And I'm going to try my best to get him one in 2020. 
because we were close. We were within one and a half rounds of winning a fourth one last year. If that crankshaft wouldn't have broke on us, we would have had us a fourth one. But this guy's amazing. He even helps elite motorsports. He's on Erica Ender's car and Jed Coughlin's car. Um, this guy spends a lot of money out there. And uh, you won't see him out there. He don't come to all the races. He comes a few, maybe three, four, five races a year. But, man, just he's a blessing to have on our team. And, Mark, thank you so much. Uh, I couldn't be racing without him. It, it didn't matter if I had a sponsor or not. I couldn't be racing without him because that's how much he's done for me. And uh, I appreciate everything he's done for me. Matt, thank you for sharing all of those great partners. We've got to have great partners in racing to make it happen, and I'm sure they are proud to be connected with you and all that you've done and that you will still continue to do. I've got to ask, I don't know the story, so I'm going to ask it for myself and for anyone else that may need to hear this, but you come out of a family that is known for being in door slammers. And here you are, you're riding on two wheels out in the open with leathers on. How is it that your own father just didn't even disown you for hopping on bikes? And why are you on a bike instead of in a door car? Well, I think we all know I've drove, I've drove the door car. I've mm -hmm. drove the Pro Mod. I've won some races in the Pro Mod car. Um, I like driving a car. You know, I really do. You know, uh, I like going fast. I want to go fast. I want to. At some point one day, I would love to get my top fuel funny car license. I'm not saying I want to race it, but I want to feel the experience of going 300 miles an hour. You know, um, I've been 250 in a car. I've been uh, 200 on a motorcycle. But basically what, what ended up happening is when my dad, I followed him racing, and he's raced my whole life, all right? And I've always looked up to him, and I said, I want to do that. And he's like, and my dad's never had the money just to, I wish my dad was a Johnny Gray to where I could just go do what I needed to do, you know, but I've had to work at it. And when I wanted to go racing, he's like, I, I don't have the money to help you go racing. If you want to do it, you want to do it on your own. And needless to say, when I started racing, I worked at Pepsi Cola. I had a full-time job at Pepsi Cola because Pepsi is, they have a big plant within 20 miles of us here in Winston-Salem. And I worked there, and I started racing a, a little bike. And that was what I could afford to do at the time was a motorcycle. I couldn't afford to buy a race car. Uh, I didn't have the room to, to, to fit a race car. I had, I had a little garage that I could fit a motorcycle. I had a little open trailer, and that's where I got started. And I got started doing that. And my first year out with it, I won, I won the, it was a, a class in Greensboro. It's called SCRA right here at Piedmont Dragway. I won the championship in that. And I was, I started out, I was really good at it. And I just built myself up riding a motorcycle to where I was really good at doing that. I've won a lot of championships. Uh, if I could count them like my dad does, I'd probably, I'd probably be a 12 or 13 time champ if I, if I could count all the championships, you know, like that. Uh, over all the, the series that I've ran over the years. But the simple fact is I just didn't have the money, and my dad told me if I want to do it, I have to go do it myself. He couldn't afford to pay me or give me the funds to go do it. Um, and, man, I, uh, I appreciate that out of my dad, you know, even more now because, for one, I'll probably take care of myself better than I would if he just gave it all to me. Two, it's made me be the person that I am because I work hard and I don't expect anybody to give me anything. If I win, I want to beat you fair and square. I want to go heads up. If if I pull up air and they break, I'll cut my bike off if they if they let me. I'll sit there and let you try to fix your stuff. I want to win fair and square. I want to beat you on the racetrack. And, you know, I'm not saying I'm not going to play no games on that start line, but I want to have a race of it. And I've been competitive. I've been fortunate enough. We do all our own motor stuff in-house here. And I've been very fortunate enough to do that. And, yeah, I would love to drive a car. But I'm really good at a motorcycle. I'm small. And I've been blessed to be able to do it, you know. But not saying if anybody listens to this video, I would love to drive a Top Fuel or Funny car. I've done the Pro Mod car. Uh, I would love to do it again. But 
Simple fact is I just want to go 300 mile an hour and just say that I've done it at least one time. Hey, fuel cars, fuel teams, hear it now. Matt Smith wants to hop into a fuel car. Get him into a ride where he can get over 300 miles per hour. Now, Matt, you mentioned your size and you said you were smaller. And in talking with Andy Rawlings, the times I've interviewed her, she has said that the leathers that you all have to use in riding, they can actually last a very long time. They're not quite like fire suits, apparently. Look, what is your workout routine? You know, what do you have to go through to, well, allow yourself not to have an expanding waistline and you stay fitted for your leathers? I don't have any workout routine. Um, I've gotten into this year because I'm getting older. Um, you can see the gray in the beard. Um, I'm 47 years old. Um, I don't have a problem with weight. I, I have a problem. I just want to stay in shape a little bit. So I've been going once a week to uh, Orange Theory. Uh, Angie goes, I think, five days a week. But I've, I've been going every Saturday. I'll go the hour with her and do that. And it's really helped me because I feel like I have more energy. I have more get up and go. And I enjoy doing it now. Um, I don't have time to do it all the time because I got so much work in the shop to do. But as me, I took after my mom. My mom is 95 pounds soaking wet. So I got her genes. I got blessed with her genes of being small so I could race and be able to get into more stuff to be able to, to have a competitive advantage because even if I got in a top fuel car, funny car, or pro stock car, that's more weight they can put other places to get to the minimum weight where a bigger driver, you just can't do that. And even on a bike standpoint, the smaller you are, that's less wind resistance. Uh, you're sticking out because the rider is a lot, is a big part of the motorcycle. It's not like in a car, you can be 300 pounds and drive a car, and that car going down the racetrack doesn't know past 60 foot that you're 300 pounds or not, or if you're 100 pounds, because you're inside a cockpit, you're, you know. But in a bike, we are exposed to the weather, we're exposed to the wind, and we have to fight that all the time. So if you have to hang off the bike a little bit, the smaller you are, the quicker you can get it to come back sometimes and, and get back behind the windshield and doesn't scrub off that much speed. So my routine is I do work out a little bit, but I don't watch what I eat. I eat whatever I want. Uh, it makes Angie mad because, you know, I'll go eat pizza and she, I'll have three or four pieces and she has one piece. I'm like, come on, there's some more. She goes, no, no, I can't do it, blah, blah. So, you know, but I, I'm very fortunate enough that I get to eat what I want when I want and still stay small. Well, I'm mad at you now, too. No, no joking. No, I, I, I have the expanding waistline problem myself. I did not get those genes where I can eat just anything. And it just it amazes me, you know, with what leathers, how they have to be tailored to each and every one of you, how they can last so long. And then, like, how do you keep your body lasting that long? So I'm glad that's the case. It at least saves you some money on getting new leathers. <laughs> I'm curious. With individuals out there in the motorsports world that wear leathers beyond drag racing, so like American Flat Track, MotoGP, uh, the Isle of Man Race, those type of guys, what else do you want to do in the motorsports world? Like you mentioned fuel, and I believe you were trying to get it set up to get on a top fuel Harley if Angie would allow that or not, but is there anything else beyond drag racing with the leathers on that you would like to experience? I, I would I would probably do a flat track. I, I wouldn't mind going and doing a flat track, you know, at some point. I, even before the whole victory thing was out, we were, we were going to some of the Indian races and watching the flat track team there and supporting them. I was like, man, I'd really like to do that. I, you know, maybe go and test one and, and try it. And I, I think that would be fun, you know, to, to do that. Um, as far as the Isle of Man, or the road racing stuff, MotoGP, I'll let them guys have that. You know, I'll, I'll stick to the straight line and, and this stuff. You know, if I were to, to put a fire suit on, I would love to do a, a truck at some point, a NASCAR truck. I mean, I think Tanner Gray's got a, an awesome opportunity right now to, to, to be good at that, you know. He was very good in pro stock car, and, you know, he, he's made the switch to that. And I think that's a really cool deal to, to be able to go do that over there, too. Well, Matt, look, thank you for your time today. Enjoy talking to you and Angie. 
So for strutmasters.com, dragracing.tv, myself, Monday Morning Racer, it has been an absolute pleasure and honor to spend roughly an hour with you. Look, any last words for your partners, fans, fellow competitors? Matt, go. Fans, when we start back racing, hopefully it's June, uh, like, like the schedule saying, come out and support us. Come out and see us. We're going to be there. We're going to put on a heck of a show for y'all because – We've been cooped up way too long, and we're ready to make some blasts down the racetrack. So come out, see us. I know y'all are going to want to get out of that house. So come out, see us. Um, thank you to all the, the fans for, for doing that. Um, thank you for all our sponsors. Uh, again, Denzo, Mark Stockseth, Greg Butcher, Strump Masters, Lucas Oil. Those are the main ones. There, there's so many more small ones, but thank y'all for helping us do what we get to do uh we're gonna make you proud this year and and win some races and do good and hopefully run for that championship and uh we're coming for you look out harley boys and girl we're coming for you all right folks that's been matt smith angie smith of matt smith racing again thank you for your time i'm the monday morning racer lee craft and this has all been brought to you by strutmasters.com on dragracing.tv thank you Oh, <laughs>